Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a great pleasure for me to be here with you in this uh, great event. Uh, when preparing for this speech, I came to think about uh, George Bernard Shaw, who was um, sharing a panel discussion, and he said, when presenting one of the panelists, you have 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And then uh, the panelists replied, oh, how can I tell everything I know in 15 minutes? And then George Bernard Shaw replied, I advise you to speak very slowly. <laughs> but uh, representing the Council of Europe, uh, I feel it is my duty to um, give a, be a brief background of how this space of uh, freedom of expression, freedom, human rights, democracy in Europe has developed and how we are safeguarding this uh, space and address some of the great opportunities and also the demanding challenges that we are facing uh, because of the technological and information revolution that we are facing today. 20 years ago, um, here in Berlin, Berlin the, um, the world changed. The concrete symbol of Europe's ideological divide pending finally came down. The wall was gone, freedom was won. Without doubt, the history of Europe is the history of darkness, war and oppression, but it's also a history of enlightenment, humanism, culture and civilization. In 1948, Winston Churchill spoke of Euro European unity with passion and conviction. In the center of our movement, he said, stands the idea of a charter of human rights guided by freedom and sustained by law. He spoke about the end of darkness and of a new era of human dignity. Probably he had another quotation of Edmund Burke in mind, who said that where rule of law stops, tyranny begins. And we could add, because we have learned it on this continent, where tyranny begins, we very often get worse. So, but a year later, Winston Churchill's idea gave birth to the Council of Europe. Another year on, the Council of Europe gave birth to the European Convention on Human Rights. The Council of Europe was the first political organization in Europe to provide representatives of governments and parliaments with the opportunity to work together to advance human rights, democracy and the rule of law, as they do today. It became an organization where states could develop common legal standards and common approaches to common challenges faced by their societies, as they do today. And it became an organization where states are accountable for their compliance with common values, principles and standards. An organization which codified human rights and fundamental freedoms into a legally binding international charter allowing individuals to seek protection against violation of these rights before an international court, namely the Court of Human Rights. Um, this court has been and, and remains to be the most important tool of the Council of Europe. And it is unprecedented in history that 800 million people can bring their case directly to this court in Strasbourg if they're not uh, satisfied with the way they're treating uh, being treated uh, in the wider uh, national authorities. But let me be clear, Europe did not invent human rights. It is the other way around. Human rights, as enshrined in the European Convention of Human Rights, invented the Europe we know today. Europe has become a place where people build their lives instead of losing their lives. That is the true legacy of the Convention on Human Rights. You may ask, is there a need for Council of Europe today? Yes, the core mission of the Council of Europe remains as relevant as ever to protect and promote democracy, human rights and the rule of law. Freedom of expression and information stands at the crossroads of these fundamental values. Without this human right, there can be no democracy and no effective defense of the rule of law online as well as offline. One of the principal characteristics of, the, of a democracy is the possibility it offers to resolve a country's problem through dialogue without recourse to violence. 
It is of the essence of democracy to allow diverse political programs to be proposed and debated, even those which call into question the way a state is currently organized, provided they do not harm democracy itself. Article 10 of the uh, European Convention on Human Rights, an immense corpus of case law, is the basis for all Council of Europe work in the media field. Whether we prepare treaties such as the Convention of Transfrontier, Television, or other European legal texts, give legal advice to our member states on draft legislation, or train media professionals. More recently, Article 10 has underpinned of a development of a new notion of media, one which explores the responsibilities of media like mass communication services and one which promotes the public service value of the Internet. With 60 years of experience and over 400 court judgments on Article 10, the Council of Europe has an irreplaceable role in protecting and promoting freedom of expression in Europe. But let me point out three, or three aspects of our work that are of particular importance. One, of legal standards starting with the European Convention of Human Rights, freedom of expression provide for a legal guarantee, which means that all 47 governments have a duty to protect this right and are legally accountable for their conduct in this respect. Two, the protection of human rights, including the freedom of expression, is people-centered because it allows individuals, after exhausting domestic remedies, to petition a supranational organ, the European Court of Human Rights. For the court, freedom of expression constitutes one of the essential foundations of democratic society and one of the basic conditions for its progress and for each individual's self-fulfillment. Three, the freedom of expression is well defined by the clear requirements which any restrictions of this right must meet. Article 10 includes a three-step test which says that any restriction must be prescribed by law, pursue a legitimate aim, and must be necessary in a democratic society. Ladies and gentlemen, as opposed to many people, and some governments think, human rights and fundamental freedoms are not an idealistic luxury which only affluent societies can afford. To the contrary, they are a precondition not only for political freedom, but also for stability and economic prosperity. The communist system collapsed and the Berlin Wall came down because the authorities behind the wall did not tolerate any freedom of expression. Without this freedom, there is no creativity, no knowledge, no new ideas, and no good, good solutions. Freedom of expression is a precondition for innovation, which is imperative in changing, changing a technological landscape. I believe that the fall of the Berlin Wall was first of all a product of a technological revolution that took place in the world. Um, Foreign Minister uh, Molotov once said that uh, the problem with democratic elections is that you don't know who is going to win. And then Stalin replied, take it easy, I'm counting uh, the votes. Uh, the problem for the communist system was that at the end of the day they were not able to come to vote because they were not able to develop like all other con countries in front of the wall, on the other side of the wall. And when people were able to watch this on television and they were co connected to the world by the information technology, the wall came down. So they were not able to control the people any longer. So it was a technological re revolution, actually. So the internet was developed by innovative people, and internet is helping the world to develop. Either you understand this, or you disappear, like the communist system experienced. 
Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights states that everyone has the right to hold opinions and to receive and impart information without interference by public authorities and regardless of frontiers. The Internet has not changed this fundamental principle, but it has completely changed the environment in which it applies. The Internet, together with tools like Google and YouTube, has revolutionized freedom of expression in ways nobody could have dreamed. Connecting people across boundaries of time, distance, culture and experience. Online we share ideas, we build knowledge and understanding, we challenge conventional wisdom and we create networks for positive change. The internet is not a dangerous place by its very nature. It is a space of enormous opportunity and freedom. But the internet is also challenging the very ex uh, exercise of this freedom. The internet is about transparency and participation, but it must also be about responsibility. The rise of the democratic space that I have talked about is a story of expanding freedom to people but at the same time, we understood that any freedom cannot be absolute. This goes to internet as well. But the uh, crucial question is, who is to decide the necessary regulations? You, me, or our government? And how can we decided concerning a space nobody owns, but everybody joins. As a response to these challenges, the Council of Europe has engaged in close cooperation with government, civil society, business community and others. The aim is to develop Europe-wide and global standards, tools and benchmarks to defend and extend the freedom of expression and information, free media and freedom of thought and belief. Over the years, Council of Europe has produced more than 80 recommendations on how to defend and how to extend the freedom of expression. With the case law of the Court of Human Rights, we now have an arsenal, we now have an arsenal of legal standards and policy recommendations on how to protect the freedom of expression online as well as offline. The protection, protection of human rights in general and the protection of the freedom of expression and information in cyberspace is an exercise with a moving target. Basic principles do not change, but circumstances do all the time. The list of challenges is long and getting longer every day. We must continuously work together to protect our right to privacy online so that there is no chilling effect on our freedom of expression and information. Let me give you one example. Children have the right to a childhood. But what about the traces they leave on the internet during their childhood? Shouldn't they be removed so that children are not prejudiced in later life as young adults when, for example, seeking higher education and job, or job or opportunities? The internet must simply learn how to forget. This should be a right. In the Council of Europe, we are determined to meet these challenges and protect all human rights online as we do offline. There is no, I want to make it clear, there is no footnote in the European Convention on Human Rights which says that it does not apply in cyberspace. So, dear friends, I started with referring to Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill said that at the bottom of all tributes paid to democracy is a little man walking into the little booth with a little pencil making a little cross on a little bit of paper. This is the essence of democracy. By the end of today, more than 1.6 billion men and women worldwide will have been on the internet. More than 400 million of them will have been Europeans. I ask you to support and cooperate 
so that all these little men and little women online can be a tribute to democracy. Going online, breaking borders. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.